I guess, while we're working. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Glad to see it got a little warmer this week or today than what it has been. <clears throat> Our prayer notes this week are for Bob Chambers. We have one birthday out to leave, which will be on the 14th. I think that is probably Thursday, isn't it? Or Friday. 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 No anniversaries, no visitors. Glad to see all, the, all of you back again. The donuts this morning are courtesy of Janice and Bob too, or just Bob? <laughs> okay. We'll make it fine. Dudley's not here to guard them, but it'll be all right. The announcements this week uh, are relatively short. Our midweek discipleship series will begin again this Wednesday uh, on the bulletin, back, bulletin board back there. Uh, you'll see the various topics or various sessions that are going to be offered. Uh, choose one and attend. I think you'll find them to be very beneficial and, and very interesting. For the chefs in the group, the meal that night will be beef tips or tomato soup and toasted cheese sandwich. Following day on Thursday, the Joy Club will meet uh, at one at, no, at eleven thirty. It'll be featuring some discussions in and around the speech by former uh, Martin Luther King. I have a vision. That's that's an interesting topic. I've heard several of these over the years. And each and every one brings new insight, new information. All the other events, you can go to the church website and find it. Um, do we have concerns and praises this week? Michael. Well, I got one of each. I'm, we're going to be great grandparents Whoa. in July. <clears throat> and then We've, we've asked for prayers before for Linda Booth. Well, Linda ended up, she, she said to thank Catherine's hospice probably in the last few days, and, but continue to pray for the family if you don't mind. Thank you. Any other concerns? Uh, a praise. Wait. As well, Weldon's making good progress with his fractured ribs. You got one. Well, he's making very good progress with his fractured ribs, better than expected, and has started physical therapy. Yes. Um, so that's quite to be probably statistically. Yeah, he's already challenged me to a race. <laughs> Concerns this week, Brenda. I know you had uh, uh, your granddaughter. How is she doing? Uh, she's sleeping well and she's feeling much better. Is she out better. of the hospital? Yeah, yeah, she was just at ER. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's always good to know. She had a little bout with colds. Any other concerns? Some of you probably saw uh, the exchange of text messages that were flowing yesterday, the day before regarding uh, both Lowell and Leonard uh, Elliott. Uh, Leonard is out of the hospital, and Lowell is doing much better. He, he did not have COVID, his son Leonard did, but Lowell is uh, getting some adjustments done on his pacemaker, I guess it is, is, is anyway, it's heart related. But he seems to be doing fine. Also, uh, the hostage, uh, Dudley, and. Betty just celebrated their 61st anniversary. 51st. 51st. Better. <laughs> Any other? Praise that I have a life case of 
praise that I had a light case of COVID and survived a 10 year um, quarantine. Today. Today. It felt, it felt like 10 years. We were wondering where you were. <laughs> I bet it did feel like 10 year quarantine. Okay, no more? Thank you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Our gracious Father, you've heard the names of those mentioned here this morning that are of concern to each of us. You've also heard the praises. We just lift them up and ask that you be with each and every one of them. Father, we come to you today to ask for your help. We thank you for your love, your grace, and your peace. You take our anxious thoughts. Take them, Lord, and we accept in exchange your peace, your love, and your understanding. Help us to turn to you and to be still, to stop doing and begin trusting. Help us to wait on you. We love you, and we know that you love us so much more than we can ever know. Heavenly Father, we have so many things that crowd into our minds each day. We become very tired worrying about all of these things. We cast them on you knowing that you are fully capable of catching them, of carefully holding each one of us, our loved ones, and all of our dreams. You are infinitely wise, resourceful in power, and loving. We know that you will take care of us because you have always promised that. We thank you for these many blessings we have, for this class, for the leadership of Johnny, and ask that you go with us this coming week, guide each step and each person. In the holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for being here. Mary Lou, we got what, 22? Yes. Again, 22. Wow. That's good. I talked to Bob Chambers yesterday evening and asked him if he was going to be in Sunday school. He said no. His blood pressure uh, was very elevated, and so, anyway. That's why he's not here, and I was going to ask him to announce our new officers when we'll just wait till next week. Uh, but uh, I just talked to him on the phone. We had trouble getting a hold of him coming here. He said, I feel okay. Blood pressure's still high. And I said, we're well, the prayer recipient this week. And he said, wow. And uh, so uh, pray for him, Mary, that they can get that blood pressure back under control. I asked him if we could just, before I told him he was a prayer recipient, I said, can we just pray for you? And he said, I don't know if I want to do that or not. And I said, well, you're the prayer recipient. And all I'm going to say is, you know, your blood pressure's elevated. We need to pray for you. He said, oh, you can say that. And I said, well, what do you think I was going to do? Give a biopsy or something? <laughs> anyway, so that's good news. And uh, we'll pray for him and get him well. Uh, as you know, I'm a big college basketball and football fan. I don't watch professional sports anymore, but yesterday was upset Saturday is what I'm going to call it. I think six of the top 15 or 20 teams got upset, um, including uh, Iowa State. Sorry, John. Uh, you know, number two got beat, Kansas. Number five got beat, Texas got beat. Uh, 
you know, Duke got beat. Anyway, just going down the list, uh, thank God Baylor uh, scratched one out and did very well at TCU, and we won 76 to 64, which was a great victory for the undefeated Baylor <laughs> Bears. So. They tried to give it away, though. Sir, what, Bill? Sounds like on the radio, it sounds like they were trying to give it away, though. I've never seen such a, <laughs> it was such a score was like this. Just being half a game behind. I think they always do that, too. I'm going to need, in a minute, I'm going to need two readers, and it's going to be a little lengthy, but uh, it's beginning of the year. We're going to start at the beginning of the Bible. I uh, just thought that was appropriate. We never had really taught on Genesis and uh, how foundational it is. Uh, that's a good word to use. And so, uh, in a minute, I want someone to read Chapter 1, uh, 26 through, hang on, get my notes out here. Thank you, Beth. That was beautiful. Sorry we had a little technical difficulties, but that's okay. Uh, okay, what did I say? 26 through uh, 30, 31, and then chapter 2, 1 through 25. Who will, who will be my two readers? First chapter 1. Anybody want to borrow my Bible? Okay, Bob, you'll take chapter, uh, first chapter of 26 to 31. Who'll take chapter 2? Okay, thank you, Tricia. All right. Uh, Bob, you're going to like this. Can you hear okay, yeah. Gary? So far. Okay. An Airbus 380. That's a big airplane, okay? It's on its way across the Atlantic. It flies consistently at about 800 miles an hour at about 30,000 feet. When suddenly a Eurofighter with tempo Mach 2 appears, the pilot of the fighter jet slows down, flies alongside the Airbus, and greets the pilot of the, of the passenger plane by radio. Airbus, boring flight, isn't it? Now, have a look here. He rolls his jet on its back, accelerates, breaks through the sound barrier, raise, raises rapidly to a dizzling, dizzling height, and then swoops down almost to sea level in a breathtaking dive. He loops back to the next to the next to the Airbus and asks, Well, how was that? The Airbus pilot answers. Very, very impressive. But now you look. The pilot watches the Airbus, but nothing happens. It continues to fly stubbornly straight with the same speed. After 15 minutes, the Airbus pilot radios, well, how was that? Confused, the jet pilot asks, what did you do? Airbus pilot laughs and says, well, I got up, stretched my legs, walked to the back of the aircraft, they used the washroom, then got a cup of coffee and a chocolate fudge pastry. <laughs> the moral of the story is, when you're young, speed and adrenaline seem to be great. But as you get older and wiser, you learn that comfort and peace are more important. <laughs> this is called SOS, slower, Older, but smarter. Uh, a little different. A woman and her young daughter were riding in a taxi cab in New York City. When the daughter noticed some prostitutes standing near a corner, she asked her mother, "What? Who? Who are those women, Mom?" 
The mother cautiously responded, uh, uh, there are women waiting for their husbands to get off work. The cab driver laughed, looked over his shoulder and said, hey lady, why don't you be honest with her and tell the kid that they're hookers? After an extended period of silence, the little girl said, mommy, do hookers have children? The mother quickly responded, of course, where do you think cab drivers come from? <laughs> okay, one more. I like this. Bob Chambers had a bunch of material that he's used over the years, and he found this file full of it, so I've got stuff for the next three months to read. <laughs> An elderly carpenter was ready to retire. And he told his employer, contractor, of his plans to leave the house, housing building business and live a more leisurely life with his wife, enjoying his extended family. He would miss the paycheck, but he needed to retire, and they could get by. The contractor was sorry, sorry, sorry to see the good worker go and asked if he could just build one more house as a personal favor. The carpenter said yes. But as the time went by, it was easy to see that his hearing was not in his work, that uh, his, his heart was not in his work. He resorted to shoddy work, workmanship and used inferior materials. It was an unfortunate way to end a dedicated career. When the carpenter finished his work, the employer came to inspect the house and he handed the front door key to the carpenter. This is your house, he said. That is my gift to you. And the carpenter obviously was shocked. What a shame. If he had only known he was building his own house, he would have done it so differently. <laughs> so it is with us. We build our lives a day at a time, often, uh, putting less than our best into the building. Then with a shock, we realize we have to live in the house that we have built. If we could do it over, we'd do it much differently, but we cannot go back. You are the carpenter. I am the carpenter. Each day you hammer a nail, place a board, um, build a wall. Life is a do-it-yourself project. Someone has said, <clears throat> that your attitude and the choices you make today build the house that you live in tomorrow. Build wisely and remember, work like you don't need the money, love like you've never been hurt, dance like no one is watching, and pass this on to someone you like. So I did. Okay. Knowing where we come from says much about uh, where we're going. Perhaps. That is one of the first book of the Bible is a book of beginnings. God wants us to know where we came from. Learning that will teach us about the place that we're going. The book of Genesis brings us back to the beginning of the Bible where the foundation of life itself is explained. Foundation is a key word here. We learn how, to, how we were created, about the origins of sin and its fallout and how to best relate to God through obedience and trust. We are drawn, drawn into tales of deceit, jealousy, and outright failure. We see how God uses flawed people in weaving throughout these earliest, earlier stories of humankind are the golden threads of God's promises. 
Promises we can trace from their origins through the course of history up through our lives today and beyond us to the end of time when his final promises will be fulfilled. Okay. Most of you have been here. Follow this little story. So there you are, a young, very young, maybe teenager, at your grandparents' house. You don't really want to be there, but it's one of those family things, and so you're there. You sit politely and act like you're listening as your folks and grandparents talk. Then your grandmother says something that catches your attention. She refers to your great-grandfather and the trip he made to America from the old country. What, you ask? Grandma smiles, knowing that at some point we all wonder about our origin. And here we are, wondering about yours. She unravels a tale of your family escaping persecution and settling in eastern Virginia. Next, she invites you into her room, where she opens a large chest that is set at the foot of her bed for as long as you can remember. A rush of cedar and mothballs fills the room. Been there? Though you might like to see this, she explained. I thought you might like to see this, handing you a black and white photo in a large walnut frame. It's your great grandpa. The only thing stiffer than his collar is his, ex his expression. Here is his father, he, she says, handing you another photo of a cowboy. And he is wearing a wide brimmed hat and riding a horse. Piece by piece, the chest tells the family tales. Soon you find yourself lost in a floor covered with old wedding gowns, photo albums, diplomas, and bronzed baby shoes. And before you leave, you find yourself the owner of something precious, a heritage, an ancestry, a beginning, an origin. You know that you are part of a family tree. You aren't an isolated pond, but rather a part of a river winding through a great canyon. You leave a richer person knowing where you came from says much, much about where you're going. Perhaps that's why the first book of the Bible is a book of beginnings. God wants us to know where we came from. Listening, learning that we will teach us, learning that it will teach us much about the place that we are going. Made in God's image. Uh, let me ask this question and then we'll get the two readers to read for us. Think about what, what it means to be created in God's image. What, what, what does that bring to mind? Just in God's image. We've read that, we've digested that, and I still, I don't think, appreciate it. Or maybe fully understand it. What does that, what does that bring to mind? Question. We got fifteen more minutes. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I'm coming. We missed Mike and Mary Lou last week. I, I can't tell you how many people called or emailed or texted and said, where is the recording? You know. <laughs> the first thing I think about just in creating God's image would be his humanity, obviously, you know, because it would be hard, I think, for us to know anything else or whether we need to relate to anything else. But anyway, that's what comes to my mind is God is a 
person like that. Except not really, but anyway, physically. Mm. Very good. Thank you. Others. Tough question, huh? First reader, Bob, okay. hang on one second. <clears throat> then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food and to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground. Everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food and so it was God saw all that he had made and it was very good and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day good thank you Trisha second chapter if you're following thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array by the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing so on the seventh day he rested from all his work then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Learning about our ancestors, sorry, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But Stream, streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were, were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the ground of the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pison. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs through the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called a woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Is that it? 
One more sentence. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Thank you. That's long that she was able to pronounce two rivers that I couldn't pronounce, so that's good. That may not be right, but. Well, you made it up. You be, <laughs> like Wayne Williams said, if you don't have to pronounce it, just say it real fast and no one knows it. <laughs> Okay, first question. These are these are a little tough questions, okay? You can handle it. What are some of the ways that God set human beings apart from the rest of creation? I liked it when he said, you're going to name the animals, the birds and the fish. And also, when Bob read the first part about the, the word that they used was livestock. To me, that's kind of a new word. And here it is in Genesis, livestock. But... God appointed Adam to name all these animals and birds. And, I mean, good and bad animals, the, you know. Anyway, whatever. What are some of the ways that God set human beings apart from the rest of creation? Okay? God sent the humans to be over and be stewards of the land and of the animals and the fish and all that. And so he gave them gave to man that authority to be um, a conservator and a steward for that, those resources. If we answer your question, I notice that's the first time he says that. He made all those other animals. He never mentions his image. It's when he gets around he to He never man. mentioned what, Bill? Let us make man in our, let us make in our image. And he doesn't, he doesn't ask that. He doesn't say that until it's just before he makes the yeah. homo sapiens, until he makes the man. Right. Good point. Uh, behind you. I'm sorry, Barbara. I think just naming the animals and everything shows just the importance of, you know, the significance of, of being, of breathing, of being a, a, a being, too. So, I don't know. Okay, uh, second question. It's on the screen. In what ways did God make Adam responsible for the earth? I mean, he, he was the first. He was totally in charge. He was the boss, so to speak. Okay? He was responsible. What, what a responsibility. Okay? Wow. Um, okay. Okay. Well, he gave him full reign over everything except the tree of good and evil. <laughs> mm. The only forbidden, but he gave him reign over everything else. Yeah. You can do anything you want, but this uh, you don't need to get close to this. Uh, it, 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 you know, how many times have if you said that's hot, don't touch it. <laughs> yeah, you're right, it was hot. Wet paint, don't touch. <laughs> you know, human nature, right? Okay. We're going to have to speed up a bit. How, how did God form Adam? Uh, why, why is this significant? Okay. Mikey, I'm sorry. Oh, I just said or, from or, the dust. Or, I'm sorry. I just said from the earth, from the dust. Yeah, dust to dust. Okay. Uh, Tricia. Well, Brian um, preached on this a little bit a few weeks ago about how God breathed with his own breath life into us. And I remembered that so well because he, he said, we receive life from God's breath. And the whole creation of the world was done by God's word. And so it's a very important feature of God. And so that we should, every breath, we should be taking in God's creation for us. And then every breath out, which should be longer than your breath in, is giving thanks to God for what he did in creating us. I love that. Ryan taught us that. Yeah, that's good. Others? I think 
There's okay. actually two stories in Genesis of the creation of man. I think one is from the mud, from the dust, and the other is from his breath. I think there's two, two versions, and okay. I'd have to look back to find out exactly where. Well, I read the second part where it said that it, of the dust of the ground and then breathed into his nostrils. And I've always been taught that they're not different, but that one in the beginning one is more of a summation of creation, and then it goes into greater detail as you read on. Okay. Why do you think God set, set this rule up to start with? We had to have some rules, okay? Uh, I thought he was very specific. Yes, ma'am. I'm wondering if maybe it's because to God, obedience was very important. Obedience. It's in there. It's in that word's in here. Obedience. You're going to follow the rules, okay? Uh, okay, how did God create Eve? What is significant of God's making woman from man? We'll stop right there. Obviously, we know how he created Eve. And uh, he did this pretty quickly by putting poor Adam to sleep and <laughs> ripping a rib out and sewing him up. And all of a sudden, here's Eve. And uh, uh, what, what is significant of God, God's making woman from man? Why, why is that? Significant. Hang on, Trisha. I hate to keep talking. About I can't wait. It. Get for all this excited. One. Going back to your question before that, I, I love to think too that God loves us and He created us for relationship with Him and with others. And in needing Him to be obedient, it gave God pleasure because it's a relationship. If we didn't need God, then we would be dwelling in places and things we don't need. And it's the same thing with, I believe, the creation of woman. We women need our guys. <laughs> we don't always get taught that in this world. But because we're created from man and from his side, we walk side by side. And uh, we need each other. So it's yep. a relationship thing. Okay. One more question. How would you describe the relationship Adam and Eve had with God at this time? When everything was really going pretty good, okay? How would you explain that? The relationship as it's supposed to be? Uh, everything's cool, don't rock the boat. Uh, any thoughts along those lines? Remember, they were human. Um, they weren't perfect. We know that. I'd say it was the honeymoon stage. A <laughs> hundred and what? It was the honeymoon. Oh. It's easy to feel anything but important when the when the corporation sees you as a number. The boyfriend treats you like cattle. Your ex takes your energy. In old age, old age takes your dignity. Somebody important? Hardly. When you struggle with the question, remember this promise of God. You were created by God in God's image for God's glory. Okay, that's Genesis 1. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. That's Genesis 1.26. Embedded in these words is the most wonderful of promises. And I've got this underlined and in bold. God makes us to reflect the image of God. 
We need that on a bracelet. I do. Just to continue to remind me that God makes us to reflect the image of God. It's our job. You see? You know what this stands for? Let me tell you why. God created us to be more like him than anything else he made. He never declared, let us make oceans in our image or birds in our likeness. The heavens also reflect the glory of God, but they are not made in the image of God. Yet we are. To be clear, no one is a God except in his or her own delusion. But everyone carries some of the communicable attributes of God, wisdom, love, grace, and kindness, a longing for eternity. These are just some of the attributes that set us apart from the farm animal. It should suggest that we bear the fingerprints of the divine maker. We are made in his image and in his likeness. We take after God in many ways. There is no exception to this promise. Every man and woman, born or pre-born, rich or poor, urban or rural, is made in the image of God. Some suppress it, others enhance it. But all are made in the image of God. That's kind of scary to me. It's a huge responsibility. And I think God wanted us to sometimes feel the pressure with how important it is. Uh, I just... God made us to reflect the image of God. He made us for that purpose. Ooh. Heavy. Uh, let's close in prayer. Father God, thank you for uh, the beginning. Thank you for what you did in the very beginning and how incredible it was. Uh, I'm just not smart enough to even fully imagine how uh, impressive it was. Next week we'll talk about why after six days did you take a day off to rest? Um, very important. Father, we... Uh, we just thank you. We love you for your grace and thank you for loving us when we're not real lovable. Um, Father, thank you for your son Jesus. And his it's in his special and beautiful name that we pray. Amen. Amen.